I'm here with Jamie Moore, Salford legend and multiple title holder. Uh, put boxing on the map in the last few years along with uh, Steve Foster and Steve Foster Jr. So, uh, Jamie, thanks for giving this interview. No problem at all. Uh, we're here mainly to talk about your, your autobiography. So the first question really is, you're 37, you're a young man. Um, you're not a Premier League footballer. You know, we've normally had about, had about four autobiographies now. So why at this point in your life did you feel you wanted to have an, put, publish an autobiography? Well, I just, to, to be honest with you, it wasn't my idea initially. I, you know, obviously I did um, have little thoughts about, you know, maybe I, I've got a good story, maybe it'd be nice to have a book one day. You know, having, having young kids myself, I was thinking it'd be nice to, for them to be able to open it when, when they're older and read about the dad and, and, and the career he had because they was only young when I was, when I was boxing. But uh, obviously different situations and scenarios have happened since I retired which again added to a bit of a story and then I got asked I got asked by Paul Zannon a writer who's a, who's a boxing writer but he's wrote a few books and he asked me if he'd be interested in writing my autobiography and, uh, and I said you know what I have been thinking about it but I've never really given it proper thought do you think it'd be a good seller he said I think you've got a great story I really do and uh, I'd love to be able to write it for you so over the next eight, nine, eight to nine months, we sat down and got it all wrote down. And uh, I'm, I'm well happy with it, to be honest. I never, I never realised how much of a story it was until I sort of started it from the beginning and read through it myself. And I sort of sat back and went, wow, in 37 years, I've, I've sort of done and achieved some of the stuff what I, what I was reading about. It was like I was reading about somebody else. And uh, it made me proud. OK, so we've got something to look forward to when the book actually comes out, which I think is the start of July. Yeah, 1st of July, yeah. 1st of July. Uh, now, I'm reading somewhere that the, uh, you're doing some book signings. Yeah. Uh, July the 9th at Waterstones and Deansgate, is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I've got a couple lined up. I've got one on uh, the 2nd of July in Northampton. I'm a, I'm a patron for a, for a, a kids' cancer charity. It's called Neve's Next Step, and uh, it's, it's um, a cancer called neuroblastoma, which is founding young kids and it's a very aggressive form of cancer so I'm a patron for that charity and they've got an open day sports day down in Northampton so they asked me if I'd do a, a book signing down there on the 2nd of July which is the day after it comes out so of course uh, I said I would and then we've got uh, a big one at Deansgate Ma uh, Manchester Waterstones so uh, so yeah she'll be good it's, uh, luckily for me it's fell on the day uh, Tyson Fury fights for, uh, Vladimir Klitschko in the rematch so uh, so there'll be plenty of boxing fans in town that day as well, so I'll come down. Uh, in terms of, obviously, since you retired, you've done a, a various things, I believe. You know, you're doing a bit of personal training, you're doing a bit of a, a bit of training of professional boxers, so yeah. I'd like to talk about that. But obviously, you're, you're quite well known in boxing circles uh, as being quite a, quite a good pundit, quite an honest pundit yeah. uh, with Sky. I'll put you to the test right now, then. Who's going to win, Fury or Klitschko? I think Fury again. I just think... You know, he got into Klitschko's head last time. I think technically he's good enough to... What, what Tyson Fury does well is he stops you from doing the stuff you're good at. And uh, he did it. He, he got it off to a tee against Klitschko. I think Klitschko is probably coming towards the end as well. He's not quite as good as he was. He's not quite as sharp off the mark. And I think two scenarios, I think it'll be the exact replica of the first fight. Or if Vladimir Klitschko tries to come and put it on Tyson Fury and knock him out, I think that I think that Fury will get the stoppage. I think Klitschko will make mistakes. He hasn't he hasn't been um, an, an aggressive come forward fighter all his career. So for him to do that at the end of his career when it's not a natural thing to do, he will make mistakes. And I think Tyson Fury will make him pay. So I think either way, Tyson Fury wins. Do you think? Uh, I know it's always possible in heavyweight boxing to the sort like to for Klitschko to knock Fury out, but Fury. Uh, He's not exactly got the strongest chin, or it doesn't appear to be that he's got the strongest he chin. He, he, I mean, he, he's, he's far from chinny because every time he's been put on the floor, he's got back up and he's gone on to win. So, um, you know, he hasn't got the strongest chin, but don't forget, like you say, heavyweight boxing, one punch can change it all. So, so if Klitschko lands a big shot, then, you know, it is conceivable that, that he will win the fight. I just think that, you know, the, if I was a betting man, I'd, I'd have to put all my money on Fury because of what he did to him the first time. Age is on Klitschko's side, and I don't think there's enough time between the last fight and this fight for Klitschko to get over psychologically what happened last time. No, I think, I think like you say, the Klitschko in his career has never really been 
sort of like a form of a better word, like won, won by knocking people out. It's been by grinding people down or by points. He has, yeah, and uh, as well, he's never found himself in this situation where he's got to go back in with somebody who's beat him, and you know, in a, in a, you know, it wasn't a great fight, but you know, he sort of befuddled him, uh, mentally broke him down, and then for him to be able to come back from that in such a short, short space of time. I just can't see him doing that. Like I say, I, you know, the only way I can see Klitschko winning is by landing one big shot on Tyson Fury, and that's a gambler's sort of chance. So I just can't see anything past Tyson Fury winning again. So you think then that sort of like come the end of the year, start of next year, there'll be sort of like some kind of super heavyweight fight between uh, Joshua and Fury? You'd have to think so. Obviously, Joshua is still early days of his career and he's still learning himself. So I don't think he'll want to jump in with Fury sort of tomorrow, but. Next summer, I can I can definitely see if they both keep winning and they both got them titles. That's that's an absolute huge fight for British boxing. You know, it'll be one of the biggest fights what's ever ever happened in Britain. And um, you know, who'd have who'd have imagined sort of five or six years ago was sat here saying <laughs> there's going to be two British heavyweights who are the top of the the heavyweight division fighting out for the undisputed heavyweight title. So. I think we should appreciate these times while we've got them because we're always moaning, saying the olden days were the best. But I tell you what, we're going through a golden age of boxing at the minute in Britain. Well, let's uh, let's go back to the olden days. So, how did a lad from Walton get in, into boxing then? Uh, fate. I always wanted to be a boxer, and we never had a car, so my dad couldn't take me to the gym. The, the, the closest one was either in Salford Centre or. Uh, you know, Radcliffe, Bolton sort of area, so I couldn't get there. And then when I was 13, uh, a gym opened in Little Houghton, which which was like a couple of miles walk from my house. So me and my mate Chris Mahoney used to used to meet up there every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and just set off from there. And I loved it instantly. I, I felt I, I always loved boxing before that. Like my dad got me into just watching boxing, and as soon as I started it, I fell in love. And uh, I wasn't great at first, up until probably the age of 16, and I started really maturing. I was probably nearly a fully developed man by the time I was 16 so I developed early and uh, I was strong and D- Dave, my me, me amateur trainer, developed my skills and uh, by the time I was 17, 18 I was beating some of the best fighters in the country and uh, my style wasn't suited to the amateurs so they never really give me, give me a, a sort of look in at, at the England level but I, I beat some of, the, some of the best guys in the country and I got a few bad decisions and that's what made me turn pro early. I think I know what you mean in terms of your style weren't suited for your amateur, to the amateurs in terms of your fighting style as a professional. But for sort of like the people who listen to this who who don't really sort of like understand the difference between amateur and professional boxing, can you just explain that a little bit, please? Well, amateur boxing, especially back then, was a lot more technical. They like this bolt upright, typical sort of British type of fighter. What what in America, especially, it was renowned. It was called you know the British style, bolt upright, everything behind a jab. And um, they like to try and stick to that in the past at uh, England. They've really moved away from it now and they've moved on, especially when Team GB, the way they've moved forward with the technology and stuff. So, so they, they, they allow fighters to express, express themselves a lot more now. But back then, they just wasn't interested. And I, I was more of a, a pressure fighter, come forward, body puncher. They really wasn't interested in body punches then. I was stopping a lot of people with body shots and... I just wasn't getting a look in, so I knew my style was more suited to the pros, and that's why I went there earlier. So uh, I believe it's 20 you turned professional. 20 years old, yeah, yeah, 1999. Seems like a lifetime ago. There's people such as myself who like boxing. We, you know, watch it. We couldn't, not got the guts to get inside the ring. So what actually goes through your mind? Do you know, it's a, it's a gradual process, and when you're young, you're petrified. But there's something inside us as fighters which we don't know why we why we can do it or we want to do it. We just want to do it. The way I try and describe it to people, it must be a primeval instinct. You know, it's going back to the caveman days, and we must we we must have been the hunters who went out hunting for the food, and uh, it, it's just that competitiveness. But you do it does scare you. But that's what sort of you get addicted to. You get addicted to that adrenaline and and the combat one on one combat. And, uh, you know, as you get older and the more experience you get, you get braver, you get tougher. And then, you know, I've got to be honest, the first fight I lost against Scott Dixon, I, uh, I wasn't brave enough. And I'm the first to admit that. And when I look back now, 
I can't believe what happened in that fight because I just, you know, I was inexperienced and tactically I didn't go about it right. But, you know, above all, I wasn't brave enough. And uh, and I learned that the biggest lesson I ever learned in boxing that night. And it took me a good three or four months to, to look myself in the mirror and go, you know what, you wasn't brave enough that night. And I promised myself from that point on, I would never lose a fight unless I was knocked out cold. And, and I didn't, I never lost a fight from that point. And I won fights I should have lost because I refused to lose. So in a roundabout way, I'm glad the Dixon fight happened because it was the making of my career that. I remember, I remember seeing something with Jake LaMotta after he fought um, Sugar Ray Robinson and it was the same thing that you I'm, you can beat me but you're not going to knock me down. Yeah. That kind of sort of like mentality, it's, it's, you said prime, prime evil, so is it, is it it's a masculine thing so to speak then? Well yeah, definitely and, and, I, and like I say, nobody knows if you've got it or not. I, I've said this to my fighters who are trained, you know, they've asked me for instance, do you think I'd be able to do what uh, you did in the Macklin fight? And I go, I don't know. You don't know. Until you're actually in, in that situation and you, you're forced to look deep inside yourself and go, can I do this? And 99.9% and .9 of fighters will get to a certain stage and go, that's it, I've done it, I, I can't push myself anymore. And you can, but it's a psychological thing. And me and Matt Macklin that night would have died, you know, and... You know, thank God none of us got hurt that night, but we, we put so much into that fight, we literally could have died that night. And, uh, and, and I don't know where I got the energy from, I don't know where he got the energy from or the willpower to push through that fight, but we did. And I'm glad because starting off in boxing, you look at some of the great fights back down the years, for people to constantly pull me and say, that's the best fight I've ever seen, wow. For me, as a kid getting into boxing, who would ever imagine that I'd be involved in one of the best fights what's happened in boxing? It's just crazy, I think. Well, it was almost, uh, I know it was on a smaller scale because it's like a more of a British level fight, but it was almost the same thing like the, fr the thriller in Manila in terms of both boxers giving it all, and exactly. it was just a war of, war of attrition. It, it, and that's exactly it, and your technique, to a certain extent, goes out the window, except for the, the stuff which is instinctive, which you've been taught from a young kid. And... Uh, and it's just all heart. That's the only way you can say is it's a refusal to give in or quit. And, and both of us was on equal level that night. And uh, that's what made it such a good fight. That's obviously, that was the question I was going to ask in terms of, sort of like the, the fight that sort of like seems to define your career, yeah. which you obviously have answered before I asked the question. But in terms of, obviously, you went on to coach Matthew Macklin. Yeah. Uh, so... We see on the outside, you know, a lot, a lot of the trash talk before fights and so on and so forth, and that's something I don't think you were ever really involved in. No. Uh, but in terms of sort of like the friendship that you, you got, was, was there a friendship with Matthew Macklin beforehand, or was yeah. it sort of like made in the ring? No, I was always mates with him. I mean, not close mates, but I knew him, and I'd been out for a drink with him with Ricky because they trained together at Phoenix Camp. So we knew each other and on a social level. We'd had a drink and stuff, but we wasn't close mates. But there was a respect there, and... And there was no trash talking, as you say. We was, we was very respectful before it. Um, and But I knew the sort of fight I was going to be involved in. And uh, that's why mentally, on that night, I, I, I knew that if I was going to win this fight, I was going to have to push myself so hard. And I said it before the fight. And that was the way it went. But um, but what, what, what the only way I can describe it is, what me and Matt went through that night, nobody or, or nearly... Every single person who walks this planet will, will ever get to go through what me and Matt went through against each other and then be able to turn around afterwards and talk about it. It, it was, it, it created a sort of respect and a bond between us, which is hard to describe, but I, I don't know what, I don't know why it is. It's just, I've, I, 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 I respected him before and I'm, I'm sure he respected me, but the respect we got for each other afterwards was, was well, it's a, it's, it created a lifetime friendship. I'm, I'm sure he did, but again, it's going to sound a daft question, but it's someone that's never boxed or anything like that. When you're inside that ring, do you actually feel the punch, you so to speak, the pain, and, or is it the next, the next morning? Well, yeah, you, you do, you do feel them, but, but as again, from a kid growing up, you just learn to, to take them and deal with it more. Your body adapts and, and, and you don't feel them as much as you used to when you're a kid. And, and yeah, you do feel it the next day, depending on the fight you're in. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not so much pain. It's, uh, 
it's a bit like flipping banging your head and going dizzy it's, it's, it's a different sort of pain but um, like I say it's people who can push their bodies through through pain and understand that it isn't going to last much longer than you're actually going through that's that's the mental toughness side of it I'll skip forward to towards the end of your career uh, and the fact with Ryan Rhodes uh, me personally seeing that I thought you was winning it and I thought personally that you run out of steam yeah uh, now is that one was that sort of like a, what's the word um, a sign to you that basically your career was coming to an end and two was it a sign what you said before about, about the fact that you weren't going to basically you know, lose like you did against Scott Dixon you was, Scott happened, Dixon was going to go happened, out on your shield what happened with the Ryan Rhodes fight was I was horrendously weight drained I mean I was always tight of the weight and I, and I was weight drained for a few years before that but for that particular fight and people whoever reads my book will realise the extent I had to go to uh, but I could have died that night and I had young kids and I think I was I was he hit me with a real good shot in the seventh round you're right I was winning the fight but I remember thinking during the fight how am I winning this fight because I was so tired I was tired from the second round but uh, when he hit me and hurt me I knew I was either going to get stopped that round or I was going to stop him so I let him come forward and try and finish me and then I jumped on him and I, I wobbled him and I hurt him in the, just and I nearly got him and then, uh, and then unfortunately he got me and the ref stopped it and, and the rest is history. But, uh, but I'm glad the fight didn't go any longer than it did because I, don't, I wouldn't even like to think about what could have happened because the, the, the state my body was in that night was not a good state. Now, I saw, I've seen some video uh, that was done it's not like about your career and what have you, and then the, the inference there was it's not like you retired after, you basically, I know you had one more fight after that, but you basically retired for knew, your family knew, and your, knew, your kids and your wife knew, and what have you. I knew, I knew after the Ryan Rhodes fight I wasn't going to fight much longer, and then the week before my last fight I had a little meeting with the doctor and he advised me not to carry on, so um, yeah, I, I'm glad I retired when I did, because it was the right decision, and I nearly did come back a couple of times, but I'm glad I didn't. And, you know, I could have potentially ruined a reputation what I'd created over 10 years, and I wouldn't have wanted to do that. And I'm glad that I can walk away and I'll be healthy for the rest of my life. And I didn't want to put that at risk, especially with my young kids. I live for my kids. My kids are my life, and I wouldn't want to, to put my life or, or my health in jeopardy for their reason. OK, just coming to the end now, uh, just a couple more, couple more questions. In your own words, and rather than me eulogising about you, in your own words, do you, fa- you know, define Jamie Moore the boxer then? Oh, God. I said before I turned pro in an interview, they said, what do you want to achieve as a pro? And I said, you know what? I haven't got any ambitions as such. All I want to do is for when people come and watch me pay- fight and they've paid a the hard-earned money to buy a ticket, I want them to walk away and go, wow, what a great fight that was. And I'm glad I did that. Every single person who used to come and watch me fight now come up to me and they go, we miss them days. Wow, they was brilliant days. The, the, your fights was unbelievable. And people say, the fights aren't like that anymore. Your fights was unreal. And I think I'm proud of that. So no matter how many titles you win in your career or how much money you earn, you can never get that respect off boxing fans if you don't put the effort in and the, and the hard work. And I've, I feel I've got a respect off boxing fans what world champions haven't got and I'm proud of that the the main thing is that I'm respected in my profession so you know I I, I couldn't want for any more Okay, getting on to Salford obviously you're proud Salfordian Uh, if I remember correctly you came in used to come into Dirty Old Town well that used to be what the the story to that was yeah I did I did the beginning part of the song was Dirty Old Town and then it used the record used to scratch off and it'd go into one of my mates and his uh, Hanky Park song, um, Crazy Guy. So uh, so I was always really close to my Salford roots and I was the first fighter in 100 years to win the British title. So I only one to, to get a Lonsdale belt, so I'm proud of the fact that I did that as well. But, I, you know, everyone tried to build me out of Manchester at first and I wouldn't have it. I was like, listen, I'm not from Manchester, I'm, so, I'm from Salford, I'm proud of where I'm from. It's a say in its own right. And it took them a while to get used to the fact that they've announced in Salford. But I'm glad they did because, uh, because it's, you know, as I say, I'm proud of where, where I'm from and uh, I'm proud of what I achieved for myself. For a city of the size of Salford, though, uh, basically, sort of like I've three, three boxes in the last 20 years, that's not a huge amount. So, what, what can we do to sort of like to become a, 
uh, well, a boxing need, capital, so to so speak. I, I, I'm currently in the. I'm getting the ball rolling of opening a gym in Walden because there's never been a boxing gym in Walden, and I just think the, the social problems we've got at the minute. Boxing would go a massive way into helping or getting kids off the streets, teaching them discipline, respect about fitness, and there's not enough boxing gyms around at the minute, in my opinion. The government should be, or the local councils are trying to help me now. They're trying to help me do it because they see the vision what I've got and they want to try and help me do it. And I truly believe that it wouldn't happen overnight, but over a 10, 15, 20 year period, we'd see a massive difference and a massive change in people's attitudes and uh, respect would, would go a long way from, from people coming in boxing gyms. So that's my vision. I want to get it going in, in Walden. Boxing was my saviour. It helped me change my life. And if I can give something back to my local area where I grew up and try and change even one person's life, then it would be worth it. OK, Jamie Moore, thank you for your time and uh, good luck with the book and no good worries. luck with the, uh, the rest of the career. Thank you very much, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers.